My message this morning is assignment over confinement. Assignment over confinement. The word assignment, do I sound okay? Sound a little ringy up here, just keep working on that a little bit. The word assignment, it means to be set aside for a specific purpose. To be set aside for a specific purpose. And I think, and I think you would agree perhaps, that there is a desire in each of us to have a purpose and a significance in life. I believe that the assignment that we're given from God gives us that. But I see that assignments or purposes, they cause us to flourish in life. You know, I saw that very simply in my son, Leo. He's three years old, and I was the other, uh, a few weeks ago visiting Pastor Peter. He has uh, some trees in his backyard, and, and, and Pastor Peter pointed this out to me. But you know, he's, my t- son is three years old, and so you know, I'm just trying to keep him occupied in a forest these days, you know. So, what I, so I gave him a purpose, and, I, and so we set about to collect as many acorns and pine cones as we, could, as we could collect. And I tell you, you know, Pastor Peter pointed it out after about an hour that he said, look at the joy in your son's face. You know, and, and, and the reason being, I gave my son a purpose. Now, that purpose was rather insignificant at the time. Of course, I understand that reality. And yet, we see even in, this, even in a child's behavior or response, the importance of purpose uh, in each of our lives. Now, you and I don't have a purpose of collecting acorns, thank God for that, but I gave my son a purpose, collect as many acorns, and I tell you, you know, these days, children with their electronics and all that, to have a child out in the woods for over an hour collecting acorns, that's pretty good. But I, I don't believe that I'm such a great parent, but he had a purpose. The purpose is very important in each of our lives. Purpose, significance, we all, we long for significance, and we see that in the lives of even a, on, a, on a very raw uh, scale. We see that in the lives of maybe young men or women who join gangs, perhaps to find significance. It's, we were created for significance, and uh, we need purpose in our lives. So the word assignment means to be set aside for that purpose. Well, my message is this, very simply, uh, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that each one of us, when we believe on Christ Jesus... We are given an assignment, a purpose, a significance. It says, but you are a chosen or you are assigned, a a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. Now, I did an entire series on this, uh, two words, earlier this year. But to make it very simple, it says, the Scripture is telling us that we have been assigned royalty or kings or priests or kings or queens. You're a king. You're a queen. We have been assigned this purpose. A kingship speaks of, it speaks of the authority that we have in life, in life in general, in your job, in your career, in relationships, in everything that we set our hands to do. We are given a purpose as a king or as a queen, the scripture says, to rule or to reign in life. In other words, to have authority in these matters. As a priest, we are given authority in spiritual matters. Many times we see that play out even here in the the corporate local church, the assembling together. We see the authority that God has given us as priests. Uh, uh, You don't look to a pastor to be your go-between in prayer. No, you've been given authority uh, in prayer. You've been given an ability to come to the the Father on behalf of yourself or others uh, with boldness and make requests on their behalf. We have been made, we've been assigned, kings and priests. It's our assignment. It's our purpose. And it goes on to say that we might proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Make no mistake. You have been given, every person has been given a royal assignment. Say it with me. Say, I am assigned. You sound good. Say it one more time. And actually, look at your neighbor and those of you watching at home. If you're with somebody, say, you are assigned. You are assigned. We have been each given this purpose, this place of significance. And it's important to recognize that many times we find that place of significance or find that place of purpose assembled together in the body, the body of Christ. We discover these gifts, these talents. We discover the promises and the purposes of God for our lives. And make no mistake, the Scriptures say that every part of the the body of Christ, 
works together for the overall success of the mission that God has given us, the kingdom of God, the the bride of Christ on this earth, which is to, to propagate or to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And make no mistake, every, the scriptures say that every joint supplies for the overall well-being of the, the body. Every joint. Your role as a king matters. You are a joint in the body. You say, what am I as a king? Go back to the series, but for short, it means what you do during your, during your job, what you do in your relationships, what we do together in the practical matters of life. We are a joint that's supplying for the overall mission and purpose of the body. As a priest, what we do together, whether we're serving, when we're helping, when we're teaching, when we're a part of the the assembly or the body, as the priest of God, we are supplying We every joint. You know, every joint is not of equal visibility. If I think of my own body, my little toe doesn't have the same visibility as my, as my, my face that you're staring at today. But if I stub my toe on this pulpit or this stand right now, I will notice and I will understand the importance of my toe immediately. How do many understand? And and recognize this, that, you know, just because some people are maybe more seen in the body than others, when we talk about the, the local church or the body of Christ, every joint is important. Every joint supplies to the, the overall well-being of the body. You and I, whether you're assembled here in person or you're assembled with us online, We believe that you have assembled with this body because you're committed to this body. And I'm here today to tell you, according to the scriptures, that you are a joint that supplies for the overall success of this spiritual family as a king and as a priest. You are a joint that is important to the overall success of this church family, this vision, this ministry to take the gospel to this city and around the world. Make no mistake, you are a joint that has an assignment upon your life in the name of Jesus. Can I hear a big amen, church? Let's celebrate together. Amen. And I apologize if I'm making a moment to to talk to our online audience, but you know, when you're isolated alone, people have reasons for that. You can sometimes feel separated or not a part. I want to tell you, you are a joint, and it says every joint supplies to the overall success. I do not forget that. Now, let's continue on. We're just in the introduction. My message is assignment over confinement. The word confinement means circumstances that keep us from fulfilling our assignment, circumstances that keep us from fulfilling our assignment. I think, again, we all want to fulfill our assignment. We're created for purpose, created for significance. I saw that in my son, uh, Leo. We we, we want that, and yet these these confinements are circumstances, and many times they are perceived weaknesses that limit us, and these weaknesses could be in in ourselves, they could be in in others around us, our circumstances, uh, you know, and, 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 and You don't have to look very hard to find circumstances that that talk us into confining ourselves. Uh, They could be our personality. Oh, I have the wrong personality. It could be our health. Oh, I have, my body is not cut out for it. I, I don't know if I can keep up. Or it could be education. I, I don't have the right education level. And one big one I always find is age. And no, I'm not talking to just those who have gray hairs. Actually, I'm talking to a lot more times young people, in fact. But, you know, I've discovered... Uh, uh, Pastor Peter mentioned I had a birthday, so I'm kind of in the between now. I'm 41, so I'm kind of in between young and old, I guess. But I remember when I, when I was young, I thought, well, I can't do much. I'm just too young. But then I've, you know, I've discovered now that I'm uh, kind of uh, 41, that, you know, when you have children, it's, uh, it's, well, I'm not the right age now. I'm too busy with kids. That's kind of the, you know, the excuse uh, that we kind of confine ourselves to uh, at this age. In other words, every age bracket has some sort of a, a perspective that could limit ourselves if we don't look too hard uh, based on whatever, right? And so, you know, I've come to discover this, and, 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 and there's so many things that try to talk us out of stepping into uh, our assignment. Time and energy are a big one. I don't have enough time. I I don't have enough energy. and, and, And they go on. But the question I'm asking each of us today, myself included, because remember, when you talk, there's always three point fingers pointed back, but thankfully I'm not pointing my finger anyhow, but if I was. But the question is, what will we allow to define our lives? The confinement, or will we allow... God's grace to move us into our assignment. What will we allow to define our lives? Confinement comes to each of us, just like assignment is given to each of us in Christ. Confinements, those things that try to limit our thinking, they, are, they confront us all. 
So what will we allow to define our lives? Today we're continuing a series. We've been teaching, I've been teaching a series from the seven letters given to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. I will continue that today with our fifth installment at looking at a letter from the to the church in Philadelphia. Now, I want to, before I, before I read that letter, let me explain today I will teach it differently than I've taught the other four letters. The other four letters that I've taught in, sub, in subsequent, in previous weeks, uh, I have taught in great detail. What are deeds and what are obedience and what are, how do we overcome? I've, I've broken it down word by word and I'm not going to do that today. Because when you begin to see how it's taught from letter to letter, you begin to see the context and the key of how Jesus is teaching. Because today I want to focus on one singular point from this letter, and I believe that in this letter we see Jesus moving a group of individuals who are facing confining circumstances, and Jesus moves them by His grace into their assignment, amen? And so we're going to see that today, but make no mistake, and I understand it, we live in 2020, and you could be watching and say, I don't want to hear about my assignment, Nathan, I have so many confining circumstances that are confronting me, and I understand that. The society, the world that we live in is being confined on every front, financially, mentally. You heard Pastor Peter mention it just moments ago. There is confinement facing us on every front, but make no mistake, it does not change the assignment and purpose and significance and destiny that God has given to us corporately and us individually in the name of Jesus. Amen? So let's read the letter. Let's read the letter. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, and to the angel, remember, again, angel means pastor, but I'm not going to break it down. I'm not going to break it down. You can go back, I've te- taught four, le- four sermons already on breaking every word down. Let's just read it. And to the angel in the church of Philadelphia, I write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open, says this, I know your deeds. Again, deeds are one of those things I taught last week. Go back and let, check it out. This is the last time I'm going to mention it. Behold, I have put before you an open door. No one, which no one shall shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie. I will make them come and I'll make them bow down at your feet. And I'll make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. And I am coming quickly, Jesus says, hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar uh, in, my, in the temple of God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from, the, from heaven, for, uh, for, uh, out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Go back to verse 8. It says, I have opened a door and no man can shut it. The open door speaks of the assignment that Christ Jesus had given this local church, this group of believers. He says, I have given you an open door. The open door in Scripture is linked to the assignment corporately to preach the gospel and the assignment individually as kings in this earth to be able to individually carry that out within the local body. And he's, remember, he's talking to a local church that's facing uh, persecution, that's facing confinement. In fact, look at it one more time in verse 8. He said, He said, Bold, I put before you an open door assignment which no man can shut because you have a little power. Little power. Little power. You know, historians have said that this church was probably the smallest of all seven churches that Jesus wrote to in Asia Minor. Probably the smallest. Least prestige, least finances, least connections. And yet, so here is in this letter, Jesus gives perhaps the clearest assignment of all seven letters, Jesus gives it to this church that is, that is in his own words, of little strength. Oh, this is beautiful. You see, again, we are facing such difficulties in 2020. Maybe you're facing that watching at home. You say, I'm facing so many struggles and battles and, and confining circumstances. Well, this letter, this open door, this assignment was given to people who, in Jesus' own words, he says, you're of little strength. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want, necessarily want to be called little strength by Jesus, right? But here Jesus says to them, little strength. But to them, he gives the open door. 
the assignment. Oh, it's beautiful. And that's what Scripture is all about, isn't it? I mean, God comes, and, and, and when he's looking for who we now know is one of the greatest kings the Hebrew people have ever had, he, he finds this little shepherd boy being overlooked by his family. To us, seems like nothing, but to him, he, becomes, he chooses him to become king. I mean, he finds a chicken heart. I mean, you know, chicken hearts aren't bold, aren't brave. You kind of don't even want to be around them. And yet, when God wanted to free his people from the Midianites, he found a chicken heart hiding away under the bushes saying, don't find me, don't find me. And yet, he's, and yet God says, oh, this is a man of little strength. I choose him. I'll give you an open door and assignment. <laughs> you know, Jesus finds, I mean, he finds the most, he finds this man with a white beard and, 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 and well past his childbearing years, and he chooses him to become a father of many nations. I mean, you just go on and on and on. He finds a wavering reed named Peter who kind of just couldn't make, get anything right, was wave, wavering this way and that way, and he chooses him to, to be one of the founders of the, the church that we know it today. Jesus chooses people of little strength. In other words, that have big confining circumstances. Jesus says, I choose you. I choose you, and I choose to give you an open door. And by the way, I got the key, and no man will shut it. No man will shut it. Not 2020 will shut it. No pandemic will shut it. I, I got a key. And isn't that how the gospel Paul talked? He said, you know, God chooses the weak or the foolish things of this world to confound the the wise. God loves doing big things among unordinary people, people who have little strength. I don't want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them they have little strength, but maybe you think of yourself that you have little strength. I tell you, there is a, you're a perfect candidate for the open door, the, uh, the assignment. Amen? So here in this letter, we see the clearest assignment given to any of the churches. And yet, within this letter, we also find, I believe, the clearest picture of His grace or the new covenant. Again, the Old Covenant versus New Covenant. Old Covenant, what's the main clause of the New Covenant? Main clause of, new co of Old Covenant, I should say, is thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, right? Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not do this, not do that, not do that. Main clause of Old Covenant, you shall not. You don't. Don't do this or do that. Main clause of New Covenant. We teach this a lot. Main clause of New Covenant, what was that? Jesus said, I will. I'll give you a new heart. I'll make you clean. I'll put within you my spirit. I will make you righteous. I will come and give you new life. Old covenant is all about demand, all about demanding some type of response out of you. New covenant, it's a promise from Almighty God through Jesus saying, I will give you, I will supply. Demand, supply. Here in this letter, we see one of the clearest pictures of the new covenant being presented to the people. It's a picture of His supply. You see, I've heard it said, to do, and I have it on screen, to do, you must first be. I think there's some element of truth in that. To do, you must first be. Problem with old covenant is we're trying to be something, to be holy, to be righteous, to be obedient, without first becoming. Becoming righteous, becoming sanctified. Beauty of the new covenant, before God asks us to do anything, He says, I'm going to make you. I'll make you righteous. I'll make you a new creation. I'll make you healthy. I'll make you whole. I will make you, and then you do. You see, and in this letter, eight times, eight times, eight times, we see the main clause of the new covenant. I call them the eight I wills of the letter to the church of Philadelphia. Eight times. Eight times. You can see them on screen. I'll read. You follow with me. He says, I will open door. I will cause. I will make. I will love. I will keep you. I will come quickly. I will make you a pillar, and I will write on you, you God's name. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. To them who gives the assignment, he first says, I will. And the point is, we grow. And we are empowered to move past the confinements of our lives into our God-given assignments, places of significance and purpose. We are empowered to do so when we are focused on Jesus of the new covenant. Jesus who says, I will go before you. I will make crooked ways straight. I have gone before you in 2020 and 2021, and I have put before you an open door and no one We'll shut it. When we see Him in that, when we're receiving from Him, He makes us before He ever asks us to do anything. In other words, with every assignment, we are first given the grace or the provision or the supply to do it. There is no assignment that He gives us that He has not first empowered us to do. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul did great things, great works. He was a hard worker. 
But he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. In other words, in Christ we have all that we need. 2020 did not surprise him. In fact, he said, I have given you all authority and power. Use it. Oh, this is good news, church. There is no assignment. This is not a message that's a heavy. This is a, this is a glorious call to purpose, significance, to joy. I picture, my, again, my son Leo's face with the purpose that he had of picking up acorns. Joy came over his face. The assignment wasn't meant to make us weary, to wear us out. Certainly, we work hard. But the assignment was there to bring a joy unspeakable, hope of glory. It makes a person of significance and purpose. Can I hear an amen? amen. The key to recognize is this, that it is within our assignment that we discover more of God's provision and His grace within the assignment. Now, the grace was always there. It was provided in Jesus Christ. The Scripture says that He is making all grace abound towards us, and yet I, it's within the assignment that we begin to see it, to discover it, to walk in it, and see the full manifestation. You see, it's a mistake on our part. When we think or say, when I feel like it, then I will commence my assignment. When I feel like it, when I feel stronger, when I feel bolder, when I feel like I have more free time, when I feel like it. Fear is one of those ones, well, when I don't feel it anymore, then I will step out. You know, I, I'm a walking example that that's never going to happen. You know, I worked here for 15 years, petrified of ever standing up here on this platform and speaking. Petrified. And I maybe, I don't know if I really, I didn't articulate it, but maybe in the back of my head I thought, you know, one day that fear might leave me. Then I, you know, then I, I'll, move, I'll move faster. Move, I'll move beyond the fear or move, get, you know, do more whatever in, the, in the, my assignment. But you know what I discovered? The fear never left me. The fear never left me, and yet here I am uh, standing today. You say, what happened, Nathan? Well, what happened was that, you know, with shaking knee, make sure you get my knees right now. I know I tell you to get close up so I can look at people in the eyes right now, but just zoom out just a little bit and see these knees. I tell you, the first time I got up here was not without fear. These knees were shaking like this. Do you see them? There we go. Good job, guys. Shaking, 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 shaking. I mean, it wasn't without fear. If I had waited till the fear left, I'd be still waiting. God would still love me. I mean, he really would. But I found a kind of joy in my assignment, right? Joy. And I'm not saying everybody has the same assignment. I'm just saying if I'd have waited till the fear abated, I, you know, I, you know I would have, I would have be, I'd be still waiting. But, 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 but what I've discovered here is, again, so, so, so you're saying, Nathan, move past the fear, step into your assignment. Yes. But I also discovered that just like in this letter, Jesus is showing, I will, I will, I will. In other words, in the fear of moving past the, 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 the whatever, the rejections, and the fear of stepping out, and the fear of moving past the confinement, it, it, Jesus is there saying the entire time, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I made that practical, but I mean, I never preached that message. But I remember when I started preaching, you know, I would stand down there, and, and there's, a, there's a scripture, there's a psalm where David said, you know, God holds me by my, Jesus holds me by my right hand. Well, I used to, hold, I used to say that all the time before I would come up. In fact, if you ever watched me close, I would, I would t literally take his hand like this, you know, uh, and, I, and I'd walk up there on the platform. It's the only way I could get up there because the knees, right? And so, but I would see Jesus going with me. It gave me boldness. It gave me confidence. Now, thankfully today, the knees aren't necessarily shaking, but my point is, if we're looking for the confinement, we'll never move past it, but stepping into the assignment, we discover what was already in us from the very beginning. We begin to discover strength and grace and empowerment that was already there. It was just waiting for us to step out. Now, again, when we see Jesus in the new covenant, we recognize that, again, even if I fail, and I failed, but even if I fail, he's there to pick me up, right? He, remember letter one? He's the good shepherd. If we stray or if we wander, he comes and finds us, puts us on his shoulders, brings us back. Remember letter two? He is the faithful one. Even when I'm faithless, he has faith. So don't, you know, we make a big deal about Peter sinking. He stepped out on the water and he sank. But did Jesus let him drown? No, he just came and picked him back up. Don't be afraid. You say, I stepped into my assignment, but I, I'm so afraid of failing. Go ahead and fail. Jesus is faithful even when we're faithless. He is the good shepherd who carries us back. He says, I've opened a door and no man can shut it. See? 
We're so afraid of failure. I know I was. We allow that in every area to, to confine us, to confine us. You know, I remember when I was younger and, and, and began to sowing and reaping, giving, tithes and offerings. I remember I was, hadn't yet even moved to, 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 to Ontario to Bible school. And I'd worked that summer to, 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 uh, to, to, to earn some money for Bible school. And I remember the Lord put on my, moved on my heart to, to give a good chunk of that away. I thought, well, that's my whole Bible school uh, tuition. What am I going to do? But you see, even, uh, and so I thought, I don't have anything. I can't start now. And it was a great step of faith. I was in a lot of fear of how am I ever going to provide my needs if I'm going to give away this money. Now, now but, but I see that if I had of waited until the fear abated, I would have never started the wonderful joy of sowing and reaping and of giving. There was a great fear initially. And then, of course, God's moved me beyond that, sowing and reaping to more amounts. But, but there's always a fear in stepping into any assignment. Make no mistake, as kings in this, in this kingdom, we are assigned to make, we're anointed to make money for the kingdom of God so that we can supply for the preaching of the gospel. It starts with this sowing and reaping, but it takes that, you know, initially, very fearful thing. How am I ever going to make my ends meet? Listen, if we're waiting for fear to stop, we will be waiting a long time. Choosing assignment over confinement always involves risk. Put that up there. It involves risk. We love Rahab. In the scripture, Rahab was a lady, you know, had a great assignment, didn't she? She was instrumental in the, the Jericho's walls come falling down. That's a beautiful assignment, right? I mean, her son became Boaz. He, would, he became pretty rich, in fact. And, 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 and Ruth ended up marrying Boaz. And, and you know the rest of the story. Ruth had sons and, and so on and so on. And David was born. And then the lineage of Jesus. I mean, what an assignment Rahab had, right? But what a risk she had to take when she hid those spies. I mean, she was putting her life on the line, if you will, because if she was found out, her neck would be cut. She would be killed. You see, some minds might say, just play it safe, Rahab, until everything calms down. Just play it safe until the storm clouds pass. Just play it safe, Rahab. But she saw that there is a risk stepping into my assignment. But she also began to, she realized that stepping into the assignment, she discovered that there was a grace, a favor there that elevated her. I mean, I don't think we'd be talking about her name today unless she recognized, yes, there's a risk, but I recognize his grace is stronger. He's able, well able to lift me above that. And in my assignment, there's an open door. She stepped into it and she had a great lineage, a great family. And could it be that in each of our lives today, we are confronted with a confining situation that looks too real? risky to step beyond. And could it be that that lie is telling us, just play it safe until the storm clouds are over? Well, I have come, I may be only 41, but I've come to recognize that there's always another storm cloud around the bend. How many of you are a little bit more mature than myself in age? You say, I have recognized that, Nathan. There's always another storm cloud around the bend. I mean, if we're waiting for the storm clouds to abate, we will be waiting a long time. No, Jesus said, I've given you an open door, O ye of little strength. In other words, O ye who have many confining circumstances. But Jesus said, I have the key, and no one will shut this door, shut this assignment. And I will, I will supply, I will protect, I will keep you, I will provide for you. Jesus says, I will. Whatever it is we need, he says, I will. Look to Jesus. Look to him who says, I will. This church was under great threat. Another thing I've discovered is that open doors. We all love the term open doors, right? Open doors are not comfortable. Not comfortable at all. I like comfort. We all like comfort. But open doors are not always comfortable. In fact, Paul said, a great open door has been assigned to me, but there are many, many adversaries. Not comfortable. I'm sorry. I'm not here to promise a comfortable life always. It's not always comfortable. Open doors involve being stretched. Not comfortable. But we need to be stretched, don't we? I found an, a, a, one of the great ways, and there's so many ways, but the way that I felt in my heart to talk about in this moment was one of the ways we're stretched is other people. You know, people stretch us. People stretch us. I've, 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 heard, I've heard it said that, you know, we need people around us who are smarter than us and dumber than us, who are richer than us and not as rich as us. And we need people of all different variations and backgrounds and nationalities. We need difference around us because it sharpens us. It causes us to see things, see things differently, compassionately, and also to be challenged. We need difference around us. We need people who are different around us, but people who are different around us are challenging, but they stretch us. 
You see, I think that's the beauty of the local church or the assembly, that it brings people together who irritate one another. But in the irritation, there is a stretching, and we are sad. Don't give me that. People, are, people here are like waving at me, saying amen. They don't irritate you that much. I wasn't talking about TICC. Come on now. But anyhow, you know what I'm saying. When you're around people, I love TICC. So many nationalities who think differently, who think differently about how to parent and how to do this and how to do that, and different ages who have different views on how to parent and how to do all kinds of things. That's a beautiful thing. We need that. Too many churches are monolithic in thought and in action in every which way. Too many, no differences. We need to be different, amen? Because we are, I'm not saying to just be different for the sake of being different. You are that. We, I am that on my own. I don't need to try any harder. But I'm just saying embrace it because in it there's stretching. Stretching. I understand some of us need to not, are not able to assemble. And as I said, if you're online with us, you're assembled with us together today. We're, we're honored by that. But we need each other. There's power in being stretched. The open door, there's, there's a stretching. And I, every step I found that I need people who challenge me. I need people who challenge me to, to step out and, and to go further. We all need that. Amen? This open door, they're challenging. They're not comfortable. And, and, and In the assembly, there's opportunities that stretch, whether it be teaching or getting involved. These are stretching things. If we're waiting for the fear to abate, remember, there's going to be another storm cloud around the the corner. But open doors, make no mistake, they transform. Open doors, we love this part, and I do too, they transform us. I know I wouldn't, I'm not the same person I was five years ago when I stepped into that assignment. I'm not the same person. There's great benefit through the open door. There's, when we step, when we move past the confinement into the assignment, there's favor, there's influence, there's provision, there's those things that we need. There's strength. There's strength. It's a time commitment to come to church and assemble ourselves together. But I have found that there is a strengthening in me when I do it. I lose some time, but I gain it back in the wisdom and the strength and the, you know, when you're wise and strong, you don't make as many mistakes in life that you spend hours trying to clean up. God saves me time as I choose. You say, well, you're the pastor, Nathan. But remember, I was not a pastor many long years before I ever became a pastor, so I can speak on both sides of the coin. But I I invite, anyhow, but you get my point. There's a time commitment, but in making that, there is provision that we step into. You say, but I haven't seen it all, Nathan. Well, there, there, could it be? And I'm not, this is not a message of condemnation because the answer to any problem is look to Jesus, not, your, not yourself, to Jesus. I will, I will, I will, he said. But could it be we've chosen confinement over assignment? You see, Pastor Peter shared an example uh, on TV this week, last week. I lose track. He's on te- television every day now. How many know every day? It's beautiful. But, but, but he shared an illustration, how and I think God gave us this picture that in, the, in, in, in Israel, there's two great bodies of water. If you've been to Israel, you've probably visited them both. You have the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, right? Now, both <coughs> bodies of water, they are receiving beautiful, fresh flow of clean water. It's beautiful, right? And it's, it's almost a picture of God's free grace that comes to earth. Both bodies of water receiving an inflow. But... One of those bodies of water is shrinking. In fact, I read it. I just wanted to make sure he was telling me the truth. I knew he was, but anyhow. One, according to the news, one body of water is shrinking at an alarming pace. Over three and a half feet a year it's shrinking, and that is the Dead Sea. So why, Nathan, is it shrinking if it's receiving water all the time? It's because only one of the two bodies of water has has accepted its assignment. The Sea of Galilee has accepted its assignment. And what is its assignment? Its assignment is to be a flow through of that fresh water. It's to release that fresh water that it receives. It releases it, and in so doing, it becomes a healthy tributary or a healthy eco-environment that plants and other living beings are able to thrive and to do well. It's accepted its assignment. It's not confining its water. It's accepted its assignment, and it is releasing that which it has received, and in so doing, it is strengthened, it is empowered, and it's flourishing. On the other hand, the Dead Sea It's confining. It has not accepted its assignment, but it is confining that fresh water. It's confining that free water that it has received. It's confined it. It's not releasing it. And as a result, it's called the Dead Sea, or it's shrinking. It's dying. And you see, that's the difference between a believer who's flourishing and a believer who's kind of stagnant. No message of condemnation. It's just the reality. 
We have to release that which we've received. We cannot confine it, but we must accept our assignment and release it to flourish and to enjoy to the maximum that which we've received. Sometimes it's a step of faith to believe that, yeah, the boldness is there to step past the fear. Sometimes it might be a step of faith to move past the pain in the body and begin to walk and to do what you couldn't do before. Sometimes it could be a step of faith moving past the fear to start sowing and reaping in the kingdom or the church, the local church. It could be a very fearful thing, but when we realize that which I've received has also been meant to to release. In other words, I've been given assignment on this earth as a king and as a priest in life in general, in my job, and in my career, in my family, in my relationships, and as a priest in the kingdom of God, I am here to, to release God's blessing in the local church by serving, by being involved. When we begin to realize that's my assignment and release it, we begin, like Rahab, who enjoyed the maximum fulfillment of the promises in our life, when we begin to release that which we've received and stepping into the assignment, moving past the confinement, we begin to realize the strength, the boldness. We begin to realize that old fear that was there, it's not there anymore. Not that the fear ran away, but you moved past it. Not that the difficulty left, but you rose up and overcame it. You moved past the difficulty when you began to release it, accept the assignment. There will always be risk. It won't always be comfortable. In fact, many times, like Paul said, many adversaries confront me. There will be many uncomfortable situations, but I have come to understand in my own life that the most uncomfortable situations often produce on the other side the greatest joys, the greatest victories, the greatest things that I overcome. And when I look back, I am filled with an overwhelming joy. Make no mistake, the, con- the confinement that you are facing right now in your life, it's not meant to put you in your grave today, whether it be physically or whether it be mentally or whether it be spiritually. 2020 is not here to, d- to-, to-, to destroy you. Oh, it's not here to make you a person, a victim. It's meant here to help each of us discover the greatness of God in us through Christ Jesus and to move us past those places that have been confining us into the assignments that God has. Wouldn't you think what an extraordinary thing to use this great confinement that we call this pandemic to move individuals, to move bodies, local churches like ours, to move them past places that confined us for years, but to move us into new places of assignment where we discover graces we never knew that were there. That's what's happening for those who have an eye to see, who have a heart to believe and to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He's saying, I'm moving you past things that confined you for years. 2019, you had a confinement. 2018, you had a confinement. But now, in the year of great confinement, I'm moving you past as you step into that assignment. As you begin to release that which you've already received in Christ Jesus. Come on, church, let's give another big shout to Jesus. Amen. And this is for you watching at home. I said it. If you're assembled with us, we'd celebrate your dedication by watching online. What a good God. Amen. I got to keep track of the time. Pastor Peter's coming back with an important announcement, so I'm excited for that. But God's doing good things here right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts. Transformation comes as we release that which there's transformation of finances in this year of economic peril, and they say it'll get worse next year. We people of faith, we begin to see with the eye of faith. He's transforming our finances to see. Uh, Pastor Peter's releasing a book this month, The Great Wealth Transfer. He says it to me every time we meet, which is a lot. He says, I see a big transfer of wealth into churches that prioritize the preaching of the gospel. I see that for TICC, but make no mistakes, TICC is every joint. You are a joint of Celebration Church online around the world or here in Toronto. You are a joint, and so the great wealth transfer is not just for the local assembly in a sense that the church becomes wealthy to preach the gospel, but you supply and you prosper in that. Give the Lord Jesus a big hand clap of appreciation. The assignment is for each of us. We are each connected to the body. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, he said, when I came to Troas to preach the Christ gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. In fact, every time Paul talked about open doors, he talked about in connection to preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. Even back to the times they prayed for open doors for preaching the gospel. You say, but Nathan, I'm not a preacher. Well, most aren't. But recognize again, every joint, without every joint, there would be no Apostle Paul. Without no, every joint, there would be no Pastor Peter preaching to the ends of the earth. Every joint supplies. So open doors connected to preaching of the gospel have everything to do with our 
role as kings and queens in this life. You're anointed to make money. You're anointed in your marriage. You're anointed in your ch raising children. You're anointing at work when you share the gospel, moving past the fear to be a bold witness for Christ, being a bright light. You're anointed for that all. And it's all connected to the corporate body advancing the gospel. We're doing that here. But we must heed the warning. We cannot play it safe until all the storm clouds have passed. We say, I have an assignment. I know there'll be another. There's a pretty dark storm cloud right now. But I know. I, 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 see with the, I, I see with the eye of wisdom that there will be another dark storm cloud around the year in 2021 anyhow. So I won't be moved by the storm clouds. I'm carrying on with my assignment, with my purpose in life to carrying this gospel to the ends of the earth with my neighbor, with my coworker. I will not be moved. This letter, these open doors were given to the church with the least strength. He's, Jesus said, you have little strength. But to them, he said, I've given you an open door. I think there is a word for us today. Amen? Amen. A beautiful word. I'm kind of done. I'm kind of not. But I want to say one thing. I want to say, you know what? The scripture tells us that every person has been given a unique and beautiful call by Almighty God. Here's the beautiful part of it all. You say, well, Nathan, you don't know me. I'm, I'm watching online or maybe you're here in the room watching. You say, well, you don't know me, Nathan. You have made so many mistakes. I don't think he'd accept me anymore. Remember, this passage, this letter I've shared today, Jesus said, I have the key to the door, and no one else has control. You know, Jesus also said, he who comes to God, he who comes to the Father, comes through me. The message I take in there is that Jesus has a key to a door, an access point to the Father, and he will never shut it. In other words, it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how much regret and guilt and shame that you face. There is a door of access to a loving God, a loving Father who's for you, not against you. And Jesus says that door will never shut. On your worst day, the door is open. On your best day, the door is open. He will never shut, and He invites you today. In fact, He invites you to, into a relationship with His Son, Jesus. And the Scripture says this is how you do it, by simply believing in your heart that God sent His Son, Jesus, that Jesus died and took our sin on the cross. He was buried, but He rose again to new life, believing that, and then confessing Jesus as Lord over our lives.